Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to another Lenin's Imperialism Reading Guide. Let's go. Everybody cheer for old V.I. Lenin. Um, haven't done one of these in a while. It's been a minute. I've had this reading guide planned in my notes for a week at least. And when I say planned, I mean like I have a script written out or at least, you know, a, a full guide written out to help myself give the guide. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I've had this ready for a while. Just haven't gotten around to it, but today I can't do a full stream. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get my hair set up. I can't do a full stream. My uncle is getting inducted into his high school hall of fame for wrestling now. Uh, so I'm not the only wrestler in my, my family is something we all do. Um, and he is good enough to go, go into the hall of fame. Um, we've already been to his college hall of fame. Now we're going to his high school hall of fame. So either way. I don't have that much time, so I figured I did have enough time for Lenin's imperialism. StreamYard, though, I just noticed this. This is freaking awesome. So Carlos and I have obviously been getting more comfortable with StreamYard. That's the software or the website that we use to stream. Um, we're using it right now. And obviously, we've been getting better. Like you see, it says Eddie Liger, Midwestern Marks editor there. I've got it adapted to my stream deck so I can bounce around real easily here and do like... Um, that's not right. Do like, uh, this, <laughs> that's what I was trying to do forever. Um, got our logo and stuff, but now I'm realizing they let you, they have some new things like this. I can do picture in a picture. I can essentially do a green screen here. Um, uh, which I need to tell Carlos and Noah and Kyle about because they were talking about getting a green screen anyways. So some new stuff like that. Um, I'm excited to play around with it and try and up the production value of our streams for you guys. Because there's a lot of stuff that I think that these new StreamYard features are going to allow us to do, which we have been wanting to do for a while. So um, hello, Comrade Jacob. Hello, Zero Decca. Only one person in the stream so far. Are we even live on YouTube right now? Um, I could see one person being in the Twitch stream, but that would be very surprising for YouTube. Oh, it says we're not live yet, huh? In the Twitch stream, but that would be very we're live now. Okay, people are flooding in. I see. Hey, yo, Hillary. Hey, glad to catch this live. I've only just ordered the book, but hoping I can listen and learn today. Fantastic. Glad to hear it, Hillary. Uh, or, hey, yo. <laughs> um, I have put an ebook link because uh, Marxists.org does a lot of Marxist classics for free. Um, they just have them on like PDF or ebook form, basically. Um, and it's not as obviously it's more difficult to read off your computer um, than a book or even like a Kindle. But that's why, for one, that's why they make blue light glasses so you don't give yourself a migraine. Um, but two, it's free. So um, I put a link to that in the description if you want to check that out. It's pretty short, pretty short little text here. So yeah. Love to see another socialist on Twitch. Definitely. We got to grow the Twitch audience and bring the socialists on Twitch together. You know, we're much bigger on YouTube, uh, TikTok, um, pretty much everything except Facebook than we are on Twitch. Um, so, yeah, I got to find the socialists on Twitch, bring them together, bring them out. Love to see it. Hey, Eddie. Hey, Peyton Mio. Great to see you again, comrade. Have y'all seen this? Have you seen the, the horse chiropractors? This is what I was watching before I started the stream. Okay, I'm going to get up here. you got to be kidding me. 17 hand, on. 18 hand, 19. This isn't the compilation I was looking for, but they literally, they crack horses' backs. And I'm a fan of the chiropractor. Dang it, that's the same one. 
I'm a fan of the Cairo. I just think this is wild. My name is Dr. Jordan Whitley. I'm a human and animal chiropractor, and today we're going to be talking about how I work on horses. Listen to that. Crazy. I always liked the chiropractor. I was just skeptical of their, like, you know, a lot of them are really anti, almost anti-modern medicine. They're just like, you know, modern medicine's garbage. They're just covering up your symptoms with pills. And, you know, not all chiropractors, the most, you know, most of them aren't like that, but they all have, you know, they're skeptical of the, the mainstream modern healthcare system. Um, but now that I'm studying healthcare administration and now that I'm balls deep in studying the modern healthcare system, um, I agree with those chiropractors more. I'm like, we literally give not the, you know, there is a lot of benefit to modern medicine, medicine, don't get me wrong, modern science, modern technology, things like chemotherapy, things like surgery. Um, there are, you know, processes like C-section births that can save lives. But the C-section births are also 33% of all births in the U.S. now, even though for someone who doesn't need a C-section, they're more dangerous and more potentially harmful to the woman and the baby. But they make more money for the hospitals. They make more money for the providers and for the insurance companies. So that's what they push because um, it's a fee for service type payment model or type system. The more they sell you, the more money they make, the more expensive volume of care they sell you, the more money they make. So if they can get you healthy by changing your diet and giving you some deep tissue massage and cracking your back, they're not going to do it because they don't make any money from that. So that's where the Cairo industry comes in. Now you need a mixture of them. You need both. You need modern medicine and, you know, these more naturalistic so-called Eastern type medicines. Um, but they're helpful. And if they weren't helpful, they wouldn't be so popular in the U.S., um, which they absolutely are, even though your insurance won't pay for any of that. They won't pay for um, Cairo or nutritionist or whatever. Sorry, I'm getting on a rant. I got to get to imperialism here pretty quick. <laughs> I'm going to run out of time talking about horse chiropractors and shit. <laughs> oh, man, we have fun over here, y'all. We have a lot of fun. Hey, everybody. Hey, Ware Pilgrim. How are you? Haven't been able to read Imperialism yet. Just made it to Chapter 4 of Lenin's Left-Wing Communism last night. Very cool. Very cool. Maybe you can make Imperialism the next one. Hi, everyone. Made it just in time. Very good. Great. Glad to have you here, SG. Glad you slid in at the last second. I'm kind of in the middle of taking out the trash, but I'll pay attention the best I can until the task is done. LOL. You got to do what you got to do, Ware Pilgrim. You take out that trash. Thank you. Afternoon, comrades. Reading through Carlos's new book, only on page seven, but it's a fantastic read. Thank you, Christopher Romero. Thank you. Thank you so much for getting Carlos's new book that we feel is very important, that we feel addresses the main problems plaguing the Western left today. Marxism and the purity, I mean, the purity fetish and the crisis of Western Marxism is the name of it. Right up there, you can see in my brand new green screen. You can also see it there. You can also see it here. So many different ways to see it. Um, but yeah, it's $10 ebook, $15 paperback. Like I said, we're going to give it to the Patreon supporters and the $10 YouTube members um, sometime next week. Um, just so nobody leaks it while we're still trying to sell it. But yeah, really, really excited about that. So. Yo, I caught another live. What's up, y'all? What's up, fam? Glad you could be with us. Second live in a row that you've made. You're becoming a full-on comrade now. Look at you. I don't know anyone who went to the Cairo and really improved it. Acupuncture is better. Okay, sorry. I include, like, my acupuncturist um, is my Cairo, and he mostly does acupuncture and deep tissue massage. He very rarely will, like, crack you into place. Um, it's more about the acupuncture and changing your diet and giving you a stretching routine. Um, so agreed. When I say Eastern medicine or naturalistic medicine, I include uh, acupunctures in that. 
about to read black shirts and reds for the first time super excited that's dope we should do a reading guide of that i should start doing reading guides of books that aren't like theory necessarily um but like you know books like black shirts and reds like histories or geopolitical books that i can just kind of ramble about um, that would be fun is eddie's voice getting deeper probably i just hit puberty last week and i've been chain smoking cigars so um let's get into lenin's imperialism chapter three so the last chapter was about or chapter one was about the concentration of production right the concentration of industry concentration of say the steel manufacturers and the iron manufacturers and the people who make um the railroads and the people who make the means of communication um, all of that becomes concentrated and it becomes monopolized in chapter one. That's facilitated by what we look at in chapter two, which is the concentration of banking, the concentration of these different financial apparatuses, uh, the concentration and monopolization of the banks and the merger of those banks with industry, which is what we call finance capital. So especially with the rise of the stock market, the banks own shares and uh, are the source of financing for a lot of the major manufacturers, a lot of the major industries like extraction and mining or um, uh, oil drilling, things like that. Um, the banks become concentrated, those industries become concentrated and they become merged together and they monopolize more and more markets. Now, chapter three, Three, building off of those first two chapters about concentration is about the financial oligarchy. So after the banks and the, um, the industry merge and monopolize, they take hold of the government, the state. Um, they form a financial oligarchy, which is why chapter three is called finance capital and the financial oligarchy. So in the first two chapters, we had the merger of banking and industry. And now we have the seizure of the state, the government by banking and industry. So Hilferding is this bourgeois economist or bourgeois academic who Lenin quotes a lot in here because the bourgeoisie at the time, the ruling capitalist class is noticing imperialism. They're noticing concentration and monopolization. And a lot of them are upset about it. A lot of them are saying this is bad. This is a bad direction for capitalism um, to go. And then a lot of them are saying, you know, this isn't even capitalism. This is crony capitalism. And Lenin, of course, in the last chapter said, no, this is just a natural development of capitalism. Um, so as the, like we said, the banks increase their shares in industry, the amount of stock um, or shares that they own in um, all industries, this creates what we call finance capital, which is just a word for banking capital that's employed in industry. Um, so this is basically what we talked about last time. I'm just reviewing my notes here. This is what we talked about before the intro. Um, so Lenin says that capitalist imperialist apologists don't reveal the real mechanisms of the system. They conceal them on purpose. Uh, so like I said, you have these folks like Hilferding who are realizing that imperialism and concentration are a thing, but they're saying like, oh, it's crony capitalism, right? This is happening because of the government, uh, when in, in reality, it's just in a development of capitalism. Uh, when capitalism is founded, when it first emerges, one of its core principles, one of its core elements um, is that it facilitates free competition. It is based upon free competition between capitalists and the market and competition between them drives a lot of the motion um, of capitalism. And as the system itself develops, that principle element of capitalism, the principle of free competition, dialectically transforms into its opposite monopoly so competition between the capitalists and the market incentivizes them to control as much of the market as they can which eventually through time through development leads to a qualitative shift in how the market is structured to where it's no longer a competitive market between a bunch of different equal or semi-equal firms and it's now a market monopolized by a corporation, by a conglomeration of firms and banks, which is what we call finance capital and monopoly. So it's a dialectical transformation. 
Um, and this is what a lot of the bourgeois economists ignore. This is a lot of what they fail to talk about in uh, discussing imperialism. They fail to see that imperialism is just a stage of capitalism's development. Um, so they say that originally when the stock exchange becomes a thing, the stock market or what Lenin calls a holding system, um, it, uh, these bourgeois ideologues are saying that this will allow the democratization of capital, right? Because now we have these shares, so workers and you know smaller capitalists can just buy whatever shares they want. Um, and then this will lead to uh, you know more equal distribution of wealth because more people will own shares, more people will have control of capital. It'll democratize um, capital and democratize the economy. But it actually worked the opposite because the big banks and the big industrialists would just buy up as many shares as they could with all the money they had. And all you have to do is get 50% of the shares or more and you can control that company, right? You can appoint the board members. Um, you are the majority shareholder and you're in charge. So it did the opposite of what these bourgeois economists were saying. Uh, rather than democratize capitalism, it concentrated capitalism and sped up uh, the concentration of banking capital and industrial capital. Um, so the other thing that bourgeois ideologues come and do, and it's interesting to hear Lenin talk about these things because they're still so common today, you know, like the uh, crony capitalism idea. You have so many libertarians today, some of them who are against imperialism, some who might as well just be neocons, uh, but they don't recognize that imperialism stems from capitalism and capitalist relations of production. They think it's just the government doing bad things because that's what the government does. Um, but the government is nothing but a tool of capital. So Lenin says that they, uh, these people like the libertarians portray imperialism as just a bad habit of a certain nation. right? Something else that a lot of leftists do is just say imperialism is what the United States does. Right? Imperialism is driven by the U.S. as a nation, which the U.S. is the leading capitalist hegemon. Right. They are the leading imperialist hegemon. They are the dominant capitalist country in the global stage. And they they drive the imperialism of these apparatuses like NATO, um, the IMF and the World Bank. And the U.S. leads the the imperialism of their allies like Canada and countries in West Europe. But that's just because most of the capital, most of the largest banks and most wealthy industrial capitalists are located in the U.S., and because they were able to, um, or they were the richest country following World War II, and they were able to develop the fastest because there wasn't any fighting that happened in the U.S. It all happened in Europe and the Soviet Union. Um, so they were able to emerge after that war as the dominant imperialist hegemon. Um, but if it wasn't for Wall Street in Silicon Valley and the giant banks, right, and the giant global capitalists who are concentrated in the U.S., the U.S. wouldn't be the imperial hegemon. If those capitalists were all concentrated in China and China had the same economic system and economic structure that we have today, they would be the leading imperialist country, right? If their government had, or I mean, if their capitalist class had seized control of their government after World War II um, rather than their working class. Um, it's not that the U.S. is just this uniquely bad nation or our people are just uniquely immoral. It's the fact that capitalists and bankers, finance capitalists, have monopolized all the markets and all production into their own hands and then controlled the government, used their wealth, power, lobbying, campaign donations, control of the media to control the government, which they use to expand markets. They use to bail themselves out when they're in crisis. They use to do wars for expansion overseas. Um, and a lot of these wealthy capitalists now sell weapons. They're you know, involved in weapons contracting. So that makes money for them too, um, as does the whole military industrial complex scam. So it all ties back to capitalism, right? It, it goes back to what we said in chapter one when we were first starting this series. Imperialism is not in action. It's not bad behavior. Imperialism isn't the Iraq war. Imperialism is a stage of capitalism. It's the economic system. It's the oil companies who dominate the government who wanted to go into Iraq so they could have access to that oil. So they you know, carried out this project of lying to the American public in order to justify this war. And now all of Iraq's oil belongs to Western companies. Um, 
So yeah, imperialism as an economic system, not as an action, not as a bad habit. It's driven by the incessant expansion of the capitalist mode of production. Um, so the stock exchange also allows easier fraud or easier. Um, the capitalists are less easy to identify. So like Vanguard and BlackRock, by example, everyone knows those giant investment groups who are, you know, in control of most every industry in the United States, most every important one. Um, they're not really beholden to anyone and they're anonymous. We don't even know who the shareholders are that make up these investment groups. It's just the richest people in the country who hand over a bunch of their money and say, you know, game the stock market, do stock speculation, buy, sell, buy, sell, and make my money turn into more money without me even having to do anything. Um, so the, the stock exchange allows for more fraud, more concentration, more anonymity for the capitalists. Um, and it allows for companies to just be juggled around after they go bankrupt, right? They just juggle around their shares, move them around a little bit, and then the company considers it a restructure, just restructure who has ownership in their shares. So even Purdue Pharma, who faced went bankrupt because of legislation that they faced after the opioid crisis or surrounding the opioid crisis, because they lied to universities, they lied to doctors, they lied to regulatory institutions in order to promote the sale of and the prescription of Oxycontin, which maximized their profits, um, while downplaying the risks of addiction and overdose, which they knew about the whole time. So they face legislation and they have to pay a bunch of money, but then and then they go bankrupt, but then they just restructure who owns shares. So it's no longer the Sackler family, this family who became notorious for creating the opioid crisis, although they're still you know, major shareholders, um, they just give their shares to other people. They get juggled around and the company changes its name to Noah Pharma. And they're still doing the same thing. They're still selling Oxycontin and still marketing it as if it's safe um, and didn't create a, a crisis and kill thousands of people, which it did. Um, so the stock market just essentially gives more power to finance capital. It gives them easier easier or an easier path to controlling industry. Um, you know, and like a legal development that comes out of the development of the stock market too, is that laws have to be passed that ensure companies are beholden to their shareholders, right? If you're going to be a publicly traded company, if you're going to belong to shareholders, your job, even if you're a healthcare organization, your sole goal is to maximize the payouts, the dividends, the profits of those shareholders. That is your sole purpose. You're not allowed to prioritize anything else. Even if you're part of the healthcare system, that's supposed to make people healthy. There are laws that say, nope, all you're supposed to focus on is your shareholder profits. Um, so as the, the stock market comes about, concentration really increases as does the the ties of the finance capitalists to the government, um, which we're talking about here with the financial oligarchy. So you start to see a legal system, laws uh, that represent what's going on economically, um, such as laws ensuring that firms maximize the interests of their shareholders. Um, so stock exchange allows an enormous concentration of capital in the hands of the banks. Um, so you now have decentralized industry, industry taking place all over the place with centralized concentration, right? Like there's tons of industry and agriculture here in the Midwest, but a lot of the shares in the big agricultural companies or big manufacturing companies here are owned by Bill Gates and owned by people in Wall Street uh, or people on Wall Street in New York. So scattered industries all around the country concentrate and are appropriated by a small group of people. Um, the stock exchange also allows finance capitalists to purchase capital all over the world, right? Almost instantly. Um, so this is also a feature of banks. They allow for money to be transferred and to move around uh, much more quickly than they could before banking. Um, but it also allows capitalism to go global because you can buy stocks all over the world now. Um, and this leads to a massive expansion of profits when the stock exchange is first coming about. Um, a massive increase in profits for the shareholders, for the corporations, but for the rest of society, we're essentially just paying them tribute for everything. 
right? That's how Lenin says that the, the more that the stock exchange increases in prominence, the more that the rest of society has to pay tribute to them. So like BlackRock and Vanguard, those investment groups I was talking about are majority shareholders or top five shareholders in all of the most profitable healthcare companies in the United States, right? So every time you go in for a checkup or you go in to, to get crutches because you sprained your ankle or whatever, you're not only paying for the healthcare for the salaries of the doctor and the equipment that it takes to treat you, you're paying the salaries of insurance capitalists. You're paying the salaries of banking capitalists who are invested in the hospital that you're at. You're paying giant million dollar dividends for shareholders who have nothing to do with healthcare, right? They're not at the hospital. They've probably never even seen the hospital that they're invested in. So this is every industry. And every time you buy something, you're paying tribute to these shareholders um, who, who own shares in that industry that produced whatever you're, you're buying. Um, so Lenin then details how the concentration of finance capital happened in every imperialist nation like Russia, the U.S., France, U.K., etc. Um, and how these were all aided by the emergence of holding systems, by the emergence of stock markets. So it happened differently in every country, but every country sort of followed along this similar path, um, like I said, where there was concentration and it was gr greatly increased in speed um, by the by the emergence of holding systems or stock markets. Um, France's concentration led to their economy being almost totally financialized. Um, they largely had no industry or commerce at the time. The country was growing rich by usury alone, so by loaning money alone, which is very similar to the U.S. economy today. There's a really good article by Michael Hudson called China's Industrial Socialism versus U.S. Financialization. Um, and we'll definitely bring that article up when we get to the chapter about the decay of imperialism here, uh, because essentially imperialism leads to financialization. Um, so not only do these banks and finance capitalists become the most powerful people in the economy and come to control the government, but they'll outsource a lot of the real industrial manufacturing jobs or the jobs, you know, the mining jobs, the oil drilling jobs, because they can outsource it to a country. Uh, who has a puppet government enacted that doesn't allow for a minimum wage or doesn't allow any unions um, and, you know, have their products produced in a sweatshop for much cheaper. And then if they can make it so there's no tariffs on, um, on trade, if they have these free, t free trade deals like NAFTA, which was enacted under the Clinton administration, um, there's no consequence to outsourcing jobs. So that's what's happened in the U.S., a lot of outsourcing, a lot of deindustrialization, a lot of factories and manufacturing plants being shut down, while a lot of real estate companies and banks and the people who give you your student loans um, have gotten richer and richer and richer and richer and come to be the most powerful people in the economy. Financialization. Oh, would you look at that? The Michael Hudson article I was talking about, I actually had it pulled up in my notes to talk about today. So there you go. America's neoliberal financialization policy versus China's industrial socialism. Great article, which I'll throw in the chat right now, that goes over this process of imperialism's decay and financialization versus China's um, manufacturing and investment in industry which is why everything is produced in China right now, or why it seems that way, at least um, for Westerners. So again, the more usury, the more loans, the more debt that these corporations are using to become wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, um, the more that they increase, the more that the citizenry, the working mass of a country is plagued or is paying tribute um, to the ruling class because we uh, we owe our student loans to them, right? We owe a lot of this debt um, to the banks um, or to the real estate companies who own um, a lot of the housing. Uh, and I mean, we pay a lot out in rent too. There are all sorts of ways in which we pay tribute to these companies, but the, the burden of debt on the people in America is a great representation of the financialization process that we've undergone where more and more of the richest in society are those who make money off of usury loans and debt, um, the banks, uh, like 
56% of Americans, I believe is the stat. It depends on, you know, different studies that have been conducted, but over 50% of Americans have experienced medical debt at some point in their lives. And something like 10 to 20% have extreme medical debt right now. Um, so again, even in healthcare, even in this industry that's supposed to be based on the public good and meeting people's needs and making, making our population healthy, even that has become financialized and based on debt, throwing people into debt. Um, and thankfully, you're not allowed to charge interest um, on medical debt because someone somewhere along the line realized how messed up that would be or some maybe the nurses union organized against it or something. Um, but still, uh, it's still a burden on people that debt is. And then, you know, most forms of debt you do are charged interest. So, you know, not only are you paying tribute to the bank, but that tribute increases the, the more you, you have it and the more that you don't pay it back. Um, it's really terrible. And it's why, um, like the Quran and the Bible have all these verses about not being a usurer not making your money through loans, not making your money by indebting others. Um, Cause I mean, it's the like, imagine giving a loan to your friend, your friend asks you for like two bucks so he can do something and you give him two bucks and then he comes back and you're like, you owe me six bucks, right? You would never do that to someone on a, on a personal level. Um, but the banks do it all the time. They just have essentially systematized fraud and, and theft and ripping us off. Um, so, Capital that's invested abroad. Uh, so companies who have invested their capital in another country have incredibly high rates of profit from the incredibly high rates of exploitation. So like I said, you can manufacture your product over in a foreign country in a sweatshop for much cheaper. And then as long as you have free trade deals like NAFTA, you can just ship it over here when you're ready to sell it and save a lot of money. So this leads to incredibly high profitability, profitability for the capitalists and banks. Um, especially during times of economic expansion. However, this also leads to incredibly large crashes, incredibly large economic crises during times of economic downturn. So 2008 being a prime example. Now we might be seeing one um, approaching again. We have uh, the Silicon Valley and Signature Bank recently went under and the Biden administration bailed them out and said, if we didn't do this, we would have been facing a collapse of our total or of the entire financial system. Um, so we may be approaching 2008 again, but with the concentration of finance capital, um, crises are no longer, I mean, crises were always bad. Economic crises always happen, but now they're huge, huge things that affect the entire globe. Um, because the entire banking system and entire financial system, which now dominates the capitalist economy, uh, goes under, goes crash. And we all um, feel the effects of that. Although it gave us a great movie and it's a wonderful life. Um, but the when these crashes happen, banks are forced to sell off a lot of their capital cheaply to survive and rebuild. Um, these financial crises become global events. Like in 2008, China was the only country to maintain a positive GDP in 2008 and the years following. Um, and China helped bail out these big Western banks. Um, I mean, they helped bail out the U.S. in general. And our government bailed out these giant Western banks and um, some giant Western industries, which, like we said, were, are merged with the banks, of course. Um, and they essentially are still in power today doing the same thing, making their money off of giving us uh, subprime loans. Um, and they were never punished. And the, the working class of America got screwed. The working class of America all remembers 2008 and the financial crisis is this terrible time, this terrible economic downturn where everyone was struggling and budgeting and everything was going under. Uh, but the people who created it, the people who caused it, the banks who dominate our economy just got bailed out by the government, uh, which goes back to the topic of this chapter, the financial oligarchy, the government or state control uh, by the finance capitalists, by the banks and industrial capitalists. Um, so the, the bourgeois economists always talk about this sense of responsibility for bankers 
you know, that the wealthiest capitalists have to run the economy well and avoid crisis and be fiscally responsible because it's it's on them. They always talk about this until the crisis happens. Right. Then it happens. They're like, oh, just bail us out, please. Um, it was <laughs> it was the people we were loaning the money to. It's their fault. Um, they literally tried to say that after 2008. Um, but, you know, these crises are inevitable. The 2008 crisis happened because the banks um, and, and real estate capitalists couldn't maintain their absurd profits. Right? They were giving these people or giving people subprime loans um, and basically just giving loans out like candy. So people would start paying them back and the banks would make money. But eventually people ran out of money because they never actually had enough money to pay those loans back. They were absurd. So the interest rate piles up. People eventually just get trapped in debt and start declaring bankruptcy. And that happened until the entire economy came tumbling down like a like a house of cards. So it it is irresponsibility by the bankers because they knew they were doing something messed up and they continued to do it until everything came crashing down. But they have to continue increasing their rates of profit or they'll go under. That's how capitalism works. So, yeah, they know that they messed up in 2008, but I guarantee you they're doing the same thing right now. They're giving super irresponsible loans right now. Because all they're trying to do with every action that they take is increase their profit, expand their markets, uh, because that's what capitalism incentivizes the capitalists to do. So it almost makes them slaves to the system as well, um, who are you know riddled with crises and destined to do imperialist action, uh, because that's the only way to continually increase their profits and survive in the market system. Um, so, yeah, capitalism creates crisis and the concentration of capital into the financial oligarchy makes those cri exacerbates those crises, makes them global and makes them hit harder. Um, yeah. So post 2008, those banks were reorganized, restructured, and then they reinvested. Right. They sold off a lot of their capital. There was this crash and a retraction of capital. Um, a recession of capital. Um, but then the banks were given all this bailout money and then they turned around and reinvested. Um, so every crisis leads to then a massive expansion of capital and a massive expansion of profits and wealth. And the capitalists and bankers never think it's going to end. They keep expanding, 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 and then boom, another crash happens again. But who cares? They get bailed out. It's the working people who have to suffer. Um, so Lenin uses an example of a mining company that went under during a crisis in his time. Uh, the shares were reorganized away from their original owners and given towards or given to a bunch of bankers who owned one of the largest banks. Uh, so shows goes to show how the banks um, or how capital concentrates in the hands of the bankers and how crises accelerate this. They accelerate the the transfer of industrial capital into the hands of the big banks, the merger of industrial and banking capital. So the banks have learned since Lenin's time to use crises as a tool, to use them as a tool of profit making. Um, and they've used it as a tool to concentrate and to monopolize markets. It's pretty incredible, actually. Um, so Lennon says on page 56, then I'm quoting him directly. He says, speculation in land situated in the suburbs of rapidly growing towns is a particularly profitable operation for finance capital. The monopoly of the banks merges here with the monopoly of rent, ground rent, with monopoly in the means of communication. So here he's talking about the, the merger, the conglomeration that dominates our country, if you live in the U.S., uh, between real estate capitalists who charge you rent, who own housing and other forms of real estate with banking capital, um, essentially forming a landlord slash real estate monopoly, um, a monopoly made in hell, if you ask me. Um, and, and Lenin adds in the like telecom companies there. He adds in means of communication, um, which allows for like housing projects to develop. Um, where banks and, and landlords then charge people a bunch of rent and make a bunch of money off of those, um, those housing developments. You obviously see this all the time today, especially in growing areas like Denver, Colorado. You'll see housing developments everywhere um, that are, of course, making millions and millions of dollars for bankers and shareholders on Wall Street or California or wherever they're at, or in Aspen, Colorado is where a lot of them live. Um, but 
Uh, you could also throw in the utility companies today too. I don't know why why Lenin didn't throw in utility companies then. Maybe they weren't as developed in Russia at the time. Um, but not only do you have a merger of real estate capital, landlord capital, and banking capital, um, but you have utility capital, these um, companies like Alliant Energy um, and these private companies who make millions of dollars in profit off of you heating your home uh, or doing other things that are necessary. Um, so as these merge, they're more easily able to rip people off on rent something that Lenin is realizing in 1917 that's really come to fruition today. Um, in today's America, the rent is insanely high, insanely high, and it, it continually grows as, you know, does the cost of living in general while wages remain stagnant. Um, but the reason the rent is so high is because the economy is dominated by this merger of banking and real estate capital. Those are a lot of the wealthiest people in the country, people who own your home and people who you are probably indebted to in some way because they gave you a loan at some point. Um, there are working people right now are like desperate to own any kind of real estate, any kind of property that can make them passive income, like uh, starting an Airbnb. A lot of people like when their parents die, they'll turn their house into an Airbnb um, to try and make any kind of extra money so that they can retire someday. Um, so real estate is a huge part of the financialized imperialist economy and profiting off real estate. Um, I had an experience with that here in where I'm at when after we organized for this was after the Bernie Sanders campaign, but uh, we still had a pretty good group of, of organizers who had formed out of that. And the next thing that we tackled was this luxury housing developer, this luxury real estate company who came in and were trying to smash the local trailer park, where essentially what they did was bought the local trailer park, uh, doubled or tripled everybody's rent, forced everybody to leave, um, and then moved to rebuild luxury homes. So we had to organize against it, organize basically and pressure the city um, into telling this luxury real estate developer that they couldn't come, that they couldn't just triple everyone's rent and force them off their ho homes, um, that that was extortion. But you see how how these luxury real estate companies operate and how much wealth and power they have. The fact that they were even considering doing this, evicting like 50 people out of their their living situations. Um, so you can build luxury homes for rich people and make absurd profits off of it. Um, and that is the reason that there are more empty homes in this country than homeless people. Right? It's because of these real estate companies, these giant landlords, these banks who aren't going to house you unless you pay them rent. So even if we have enough houses for everybody, we're going to have people living on the streets in the cold um, because they can't pay rent to these multi, multi, multi millionaires on Wall Street. Um, and these real estate developers will flock to growing areas where land prices are riding or rising. Like I said, places like Denver, Colorado um, over the last few years. I don't know if that's anymore. But, um, so Lenin said Lenin says something interesting here. He says that a lot of the bourgeois scholars at the time um, who are arguing in favor of capitalism are um, embracing American ethics, which is basically laissez-faire, free market, do as thou wilt ethics, um, which had always been condemned by European scholars, which European scholars had always looked at and said, that's stupid and that's callous and that's immoral. But they were increasingly being embraced as capitalism became global and as global finance capital spread, these, this American ethic of you know individualism, uh, do what you want and build as much wealth as you can. And that's what makes you a good person. That's what makes you powerful. Um, step on other people's throats to do so. Um, that kind of ethic, that kind of ideology started to become popularized globally, including in Europe. Very interesting thing that Kat Lennon says there. And you see how intellectual production or ideology or information is all a product of the relations of production. It's all a product of the economic system. So as capitalism develops into its imperialist stage, its monopoly finance capitalist stage and goes abroad, um, it also spreads this sort of ideology and brings this individualistic ethic along with it. Um, so 
where the places where capitalism is transforming into its monopoly finance capital stage, says Lenin, um, the governments become financial oligarchies dominated by these capitalists. So we're finally getting into the name of the chapter here. Um, we've mentioned it a handful of times, but now we're going to talk about the formation of financial oligarchies specifically. Um, so when it says that once formed, monopolies penetrate every sphere of life, regardless of the government form. So even if, you know, there isn't a um, government dominated by the banks or the financial oligarchs, they're still going to have, you know, control over almost every aspect of your life um, just because of their control of the economy. However, government officials increasingly start to become employed by the banks or former employees of the banks. And we have the formation of what's called the revolving door. Um, so politicians will spend time in office and that time is basically an audition for the banking sector, an audition for a lucrative job banking. So there was this really popular politician that some people might remember named Paul Ryan. He was a Republican politician. I remember him because he was out of Wisconsin, but he retired from politics when he was in his 30s. And I remember not understanding it. He was in his 30s or 40s. And people were saying that this guy was going to, you know, potentially run for president. And he was potentially the future of the Republican Party. I didn't get it. But what he then did was took this super lucrative executive position with a giant bank. So his time in office where he deregulated the economy and gave the big banks everything they wanted um and did everything that the imperialists wanted was an audition for the banking sector then he gets out of office and he's got this cushy lucrative job where he doesn't have to do much um, but he can make millions of dollars for the rest of his life until we overthrow him in a socialist revolution um, but at lenin's time during this monopolization process and financialization process um, is when this revolving door first starts to become a thing um, so one ger German bourgeois pro-capitalist author studying the transformation of uh, capitalism into a plutocracy, which is just a government dominated by the rich. Um, he said the economic liberty guaranteed by the German constitution has become in many departments of economic life a meaningless phrase. There's no more economic liberty. Even the widest political, li political liberty cannot save us from being converted into a nation of unfree people. So here we see what I always talk about, the failure of liberalism to live up to his own, its own ideals. Right? So you have these liberal revolutions, the overthrow of feudalism. Um, in, in the U.S., you have the overthrow of slavery in the South but um, and the murder of indigenous people who are already here. Uh, but in Europe, you have the overthrow of feudalism, and then these liberal enlightenment ideals are used to found new governments. Um, and it's based on freedom. It's based on uh, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of political expression. And uh, in Germany, they had something written about economic freedom, too. But as this process of concentration of finance capital plays out and the banks start to seize the state, there is no economic freedom. Any welfare state, any economic freedom for the people starts to be dismantled by the, the banks who control the government. Um, and then they start to use those governments increasingly as a tool to bludgeon the working masses and prevent them from, you know, engaging in revolutionary activity. Uh, they use the state as a tool of suppression for their own means. And in doing so, all those political rights and political freedoms that were promised during the founding of the country, promised in the Constitution, uh, go away. They're overtaken because the dominant economic class doesn't want you to have freedom of political speech. If you had freedom of political speech and you were allowed to share TikToks without having seven of your accounts banned like us, um, the people might move to socialism. They might overthrow the ruling economic class. So the ruling economic class can't allow it. Um, and, you know, all these ideas about liberal freedom, all these liberal ideas of freedom and democracy uh, become a joke, essentially, like in the U.S. Does anyone believe we have a democracy here where 93 percent of elections are decided by the candidate who raises the most money and where our media is um, laughably controlled and concentrated into the hands of finance capitalists? Of course, we don't have a democracy, yet that's what we're told our country is based on. And that's why we're told we have to go into Iraq and Afghanistan and kill millions of people to bring them democracy and freedom. It's a joke. These these ideals that liberal democracies were founded on become laughable as capitalism develops and as the financial oligarchy is formed 
and banks and industrial capitalists come to monopolize the entire and control the entire political and economic system. Um, so and next, I want to read something from the bottom of page 59 in my copy. Um, this is Lenin uh, speaking for himself, not quoting anyone. He says, is it characteristic of capitalism in general that the ownership of capital is separated from the application of capital to production? That money capital is separated from industrial or productive capital? And that the rentier who lives entirely on income obtained from money capital is separated from the entrepreneur and from all who are directly concerned in the management of capital? Imperialism or the domination of finance capital is that highest stage of capitalism in which this separation reaches vast proportions. The supremacy of finance capital over all other forms of capital means the predominance of the rentier and of the financial oligarchy. It means the crystallization of a small number of financially powerful states from all the rest. The extent to which this process is going on may be judged from the statistics on emissions, blah, 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 blah. He goes on to prove it. Um, but he says here that in capitalism, the capitalist, the person who appropriates the, the product, appropriates what's produced, um, is disconnected from production. He doesn't actually work. He doesn't actually go into the factory 12 hours a day. His workers do it for him. He just takes their product. Um, but with the concentration of capital and the move to the uh, financialization, this separation becomes even greater to the point where now, like I explained earlier, you have agriculture in the Midwest, farmers in the Midwest, whose product, whose profit is going to Bill Gates and is going to shareholders on Wall Street who have never been on a farm in their lives, who've probably never seen a pig or a cow in real life. Who have no idea how farming labor works they have no idea what goes into it they have no idea how hard it is and how tough you have to be to do it they don't know anything like this yet all of the profits from agricultural labor and agricultural activities go to people like bill gates complete and total separation of the capitalists in charge of production from the production process itself that they're appropriating the surplus of um, so, and, you know, since, since Lenin's time, the U S dominated global financial system has really developed, um, and allowed them to do this all over the place, allow them to exploit like Bill Gates owns a lot of the agricultural stuff in Africa. So, you know, literally from across the world, he's sucking wealth out of these places, complete separation of production and the capitalists in charge of production. Um, Lenin says that every state turns into a rival imperialist state. Um, at the end of World War II, and, and I would read Vijay Prashad's Washington Bullets if you want a better analysis of this, um, but the U.S. really takes over as the dominant imperialist hegemon, and along with that comes the development of U.S.-dominated financial systems globally. So you have the creation of the IMF and the World Bank after World War II, essentially global central banks dominated by the U.S. and Western finance capitalists. Um, and then they create thousands and thousands of little arms, little tentacles, smaller, medium and small sized banks, which we talked about in Chapter two, how large banks can control um, a, a conglomerate of other small banks. That's essentially what the entire world has now, except for socialist countries that have kicked the U.S. out and said, we're going to control our own banking system. Um, that's what Libya tried to do before NATO killed Gaddafi. Um, but the global financial system is now largely dominated by banks in the U.S. and U.K., shareholders on London and Wall Street, and then the U.S. and U.K. government, Western finance capitalists. Um, so the formation of oligarchies due to the dominance of finance capital happens at the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century, which is at the same time this qualitative shift happens in capitalism from free competition into monopoly capitalism. You also have the seizure of the government by the monopoly capitalists and the finance capitalists. Uh, qualitative shift, as we call it, from capitalism to its imperialist stage. So at this point, the, uh, the French and the British are the dominant imperialist powers. They had most of the colonies. The U.S. and Germany were hot on their tail. Um, this was during the turn of the century in, in the lead up to 1917 when Lenin would publish this. Um, you know, Both the U.S. and Germany, who Lenin said were hot on the tail of 
the French and the UK um, would go on to try and seize and dominate the entire world within the next 30 years. Uh, so it's safe to say that Lenin nailed that, that prediction. Um, as the imperialist oligarchies were developing in Germany, uh, that would culminate in Hitler trying to seize the whole world. And then in the U.S. It would culminate in them pretty much seizing the whole world and creating the unipolar system that we have today or that's crumbling today with the growth of China and the anti-imperialist world. But um, Lenin says or calls these four countries, the U.K., French, U.S., and um Germany, the four pillars of finance capital. Today, that's basically just the U.S. and West Europe. You know, the IMF and the World Bank is the the central global pillar of finance capital, um, which all other finance capital operations rotate around, or or are connected to, or concentrated into. Um, I mean, the IMF and the World Bank, but then you also have Goldman Sachs, um, U.S. Bank, Citibank all these giant Western banks that have tendrils everywhere and control capital and shares everywhere. Um, so all the same people <laughs> for the most part. And now China is offering a direct counter to U.S. finance capitalist dominance with BRICS, the Belt and Road Initiative, where China is taking their state-owned banks, these banks owned by the Chinese government, which is controlled by the Chinese workers, Chinese working people, um, or the Chinese masses, and they're offering countries in Africa or countries in Latin America or countries in the Middle East, especially those countries who have been devastated and sanctioned and bombed by the U.S. for years, um, developmental loans. China's saying, we'll give you these loans similar to the loans that the U.S. gave their West European allies after World War II and the Marshall Plan to help build them up. Um, with very low interest, about 4% interest rates. Um, and China's out actually been forgiving a lot of the debt too when countries are unable to pay it. But it allows these countries to develop industry, which is what US financial or the US financial system prevents them from doing. Right. So the the US global dominated financial system allows them to say, okay, Venezuela, you're trying to move towards socialism and your main industry is oil. We're not going to finance any any oil capital. We're not going to finance any kind of development in Venezuela that's not going to Western multinationals. And we're not going to finance any kind of development aimed at diversifying your economy. Right. So Venezuela wanted to take their oil and use that to develop other sectors of their economy, agriculture, uh, you know, their education sector, things like this, um, and welfare programs as well. So the U.S. can say, you know, we're not going to finance anything else. So, you know, you're only going to be able to get financing um, for oil if that's oil that Western multinationals have access to. And pretty much every country in the global economy relies on financing from the IMF and the World Bank, which the DPRK is the only country who's not part of the IMF and World Bank, which is crazy that they've been able to survive despite that. But um, it puts them at a huge disadvantage. Uh, famously... Um, Richard Nixon, after Salvador Allende, the socialist, was elected in Chile, he said, make the economy scream. And IMF and World Bank financing in Chile went from $200 million a year to $2 million a year. So things like this, right? When a socialist government takes power, that country's used to financing from the IMF and the World Bank, and the IMF and World Bank can just cut it off, or they can uh, bring it down to almost nothing. This is the power that this global US dominated financial system gives the Western finance capitalists, that it gives these Western banks and Western industrialists, uh, both economically and politically, because they can use this to control the political systems of whatever country they want. So China coming in and saying, no, 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 you don't have to take out a loan with the IMF and the World Bank, which is also gonna be a super high interest loan aimed at trapping countries in debt, um, like the notorious structural adjustment loans from the IMF and World Bank, um, and then make those countries subservient to the West. Rather than that, China's saying, come take out a loan with us, build up your industry, your productive capacity, so you become self-sufficient, so you're not reliant on financing from the West and from the IMF and the World Bank, um, and then we won't trap you in debt, right? And this is why China is driving the U.S. crazy with what they're doing. They just keep investing, developing, investing, developing, forging alliances, investing, developing, signing a new country to BRICS, investing, developing. And the U.S. can't do anything about it. 
It's like, ah, oh, this, this authoritarian trade and, and economics going on, <laughs> China giving these countries industry is so authoritarian, right? They, it almost, it does sound ridiculous, the things that the U.S. is saying, especially since they've kept these countries in debt and tried to destroy them for so long. Um, but it's China playing the long game. And that's why it's so funny when people say that, you know, China is imperialist because they have finance capital, right? China's imperialist because of the Belt and Road Initiative where they're giving loans to other countries. They're doing exactly what the IMF and World Bank did. When if you look at the way the BRICS system is structured and China's loans are structured, they're structured as a direct counter to the US structural adjustment loans to the IMF, World Bank and US dominated financial system. They're giving countries a lifeline to get away from this terrible, decrepit, exploitative financial system because China understands Marxism-Leninism. They understand how capitalism works. They understand what, how the Western finance capitalists tick, what they're actually after, which is exploitation, cheap resources and labor, ultimately to maximize their surplus value, for increased surplus value. So, And they understand that imperialism prevents the productive forces in various countries from developing, which we'll talk about a lot more when we get to the chapter on export capital. So by China developing industry in these countries, it makes them less susceptible to U.S. imperialist tactics and economic warfare. It makes them less subservient um, to the West and their financial organs. So China, China is not going against Lenin. They're not going back on what Lenin wrote and moving towards imperialism and neocolonialism. Rather, they understand Lenin, they understand neocolonialism, so they've moved to create a financial system that's not capitalistic and imperialistic, that can counter the capitalistic and imperialistic financial system of the West. So the next chapter, that's the end of chapter three. The next one that we will go over is the chapter on export capital. This is my favorite chapter in the book because it helped me understand Venezuela, which I had been studying at the time that I read this. Um, it's, we're going to talk about the way that capitalists export capital to a country that they're trying to exploit. Cause say, if that country has a lot of oil, the Western finance capitalists are going to export oil drills, but then the entire economy in that country develops around oil in a very exploitative fashion, because all of the surplus from that oil, rather than going to capitalists in Venezuela, who can then invest it elsewhere and lead the economy to develop the industry to develop. The surplus of the Venezuelan oil is being sucked out of Venezuela and brought to America and the UK. It's being brought to Europe and North America. So it's not being used to diversify the Venezuelan economy and the whole economy then becomes dependent on oil. So when they try to transition to socialism, the US sanctions their oil and it essentially shuts down their entire economy. And then Western social Democrats like Naomi Klein will come out and be like, oh, Venezuela is not real socialism. They're bad and stupid because they're too dependent on oil and oil's bad for the environment. It's like, well, they're dependent on oil because of a hundred years of colonialism, imperialism, and export capital, export capital. And then of course the IMF and World Bank isn't gonna finance the development of anything except for oil that's controlled by Western multinationals. I was referencing Venezuela with that example I was using earlier. Um, so yeah, that's the next chapter and I'm real excited for that because I think it's real important to understanding imperialism and imperialism, not just as an action, but as a stage of capitalism's development. Now, you have to understand the export capital that these com that uh, prevents countries' economies from developing, um, that allows Western multinationals to suck economic value out of these countries. Um, that leads to massive profits in the West, in the imperialist countries, which they then become reliant on, right? And as we know, capitalism forces you to continually expand your profits. So if you make super profits off Venezuela, the next year you got to make more. So what are you going to do? Are you going to move on and exploit Colombia or Ecuador or more countries, more colonies? You have to, you have to find some way to increase your profits. Maybe you should increase the interest that you're charging people on the debt that they owe you. Who knows? But this is how capitalism works and how it leads to imperialism and parasitism. <laughs> Chapter three complete. We did it. Woo! 
We did it. The, excuse me. Whoa. I'm not even super late. I do have to check my phone though, to make sure I don't miss my uncle's Hall of Fame induction. <laughs> Wouldn't want to do that. China played its cards perfectly. I agree for the most part. I don't know what they could have done different. The dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. I haven't read imperialism yet, but I jumped between your reading guides and S4A. Nice. Isn't socialism for all? I go, I always thought he was not good. But <laughs> if that's who you're referencing by S4A, but maybe he has good imperialism guides. I can't remember what socialism hey. for all said. Aren't they like anti-China and like pro-imperialist socialism? I don't know. Well, S. Frey is a lib. That's what I thought. But I mean, if you like his videos and you get good information from him, it's totally fine. But It would be interesting to hear the analysis of Lenin's imperialism from somebody who doesn't support China. Um, I'm not sure their personal views. Well, it's not really his personal views. It's his political or imperialist views, but. S phrase, okay, but IRC, the last stream this past Wednesday, S Frey apparently recommended reading Pullis Sturm, who a group of self-professed and apparently young slash inexperienced MLs who are all over the place and who bash modern China without even taking into account the challenges they face. Yeah, they came after us, Pullis Sturm did about our China video, and it was I mean, I mean it was fine. You could tell their hearts were in the right place, but it was just dumb arguments that we had debunked about china 700 times um and it's just like people it's what vj prashad says like and i mean if, if they're young and inexperienced i'm sure they'll learn to and i can cut them some more slack but it's like vj says we have a world to win not a world to define right china's the regardless of whether you think they're real socialism or not they are the most socialistic anti-imperialistic country in the in the world in the globe. They call themselves socialist. They say that they're moving towards communism. They have a communist party with a hundred million members who's extremely, extremely active in the government and the economy and the everyday lives of their people. All right. So why would we look at that and be like, this is bad. I'm going to denounce this. This isn't good. It's the best example that we have of Marxism in action in the modern day. They've abolished relative poverty. Right. How can we look at this and dismiss it? Because, you know, they you, you can say, oh, they have banks. Right. Like I was saying earlier, they have finance capital at their belt and road. Lenin says finance capital equals capitalism. China's capitalist. I'm going to deny everything they do. Like, this is so stupid. This is so stupid. You're just trying to create some super specific definition of socialism that's undialectical and doesn't evolve with evolving and changing material conditions. Um, so that you can say China's not real socialism according to this definition I just made up. Like, cool. Okay. They're not real socialism according to you. I'm going to go study how they abolish poverty so I can try and do that in my country. Um, you keep telling people how China not real socialism. <laughs> Thank you so much, YHWH, for the $10 super chat. Big time. Moolah. Supporting our project. That's like enough to buy another copy of Lenin's Imperialism. I just might. It's mine's getting kind of old. I loaned it to a friend and he messed it up and I was really mad at him. And he didn't even read it. And I said, I will never loan you anything again. Um, so <laughs> it says, do you know if Parenti would be upset if I was to pirate black shirts and resin to kill a nation and translate them into Spanish? It's for a good cause. I don't think he would be upset at all probably um 
I'm sure he's not too concerned with the royalties he gets on those books. Maybe. I mean, maybe they pay for his care um, now that he's older. Um, so maybe you should at least buy the book. But I think, are they not translated into Spanish yet? Um, that's kind of crazy. There's a really good PDF of Black Shirts and Red. There's a bunch of them. It's like up as a blog post somewhere too. Um, but I can't believe it's not in Spanish. That's too bad. Las Camisas Negra y Roja. That's what it would be called. <laughs> I could tell you that, I guess. Um, I don't know. I'll ask Christian Parenti, but I say go for it. If you translate them into Spanish, I'm going to read them because I've been working on my Spanish, obviously, and that's my, my favorite book of all time. So. Um, thanks again for the super chat, comrade. Appreciate you. That's why I don't loan out things willy nilly. LOL. Yeah, I don't anymore. I've lost too much. I lost some of my Mao texts. I lost. I don't even want to think about all the books that I've lost from loaning them out because it'll make me sad because um, of commodity fetishism. But I'm always like, I'm a communist. You know, I can't. The, the point of these books is to spread education. I don't care if I even get it back. Just make sure to actually read it. It's usually what I tell people if I'm going to loan them something. I also just keep like copies of the manifesto. I always have like two or three and they can just give them away. Someone said that they're going to start going around to those like little book, like free book spots in their town, which my town has a bunch of them and putting like theory. I thought that was an awesome idea because I always look right. Every time there's free books, I look in there like maybe there's the manifesto or something, you know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but and there never is, but there could be if I put it in there. Um How can I start learning Spanish? I don't know. My my dad's a Spanish teacher. Mi padre is from maestro de español. And um, yo uso Duolingo um, ahora. Um, y es bien, pero es difícil. It's, it's Duolingo is the app I use. It's good, but you it's really hard if you don't already have a Spanish base. Like I had already taken Spanish 1, 2, 3, 4 in high school with my dad and he had spoken Spanish to us growing up my whole life. And now Duolingo really helps, but you also need a base and you need other stuff outside of Duolingo. So um, you learn by speaking it and listening to it and studying it. <laughs> Indeed, it's kind of difficult as a second language, is it? Interesting. Move to Latin America. Yeah, there you go. That's how you'll learn it the fastest. <laughs> Duolingo is decent. I'd also recommend some YouTube channels. Oh, that's that's cool. Um, I haven't tried any YouTube channels for Spanish. Maybe I should. I am doing... I meant to do chapter six of this today, Capitulo Seis, but I didn't get around to it because I wanted to also get this reading guide done. Um, but this is about the Cuban Revolution, and it's like a beginner Spanish reader. Um, it's like... Casa de Vida, because one of, uh, uh, div, Casa Dividida, Dividida, because, uh, there's like a, a tobacco owning family who's one of the capitalist plantation owning families, one of the richest ones in Cuba before the revolution. And then there's a working class family whose daughter dies because she doesn't have actor, they can't get into the hospital because they're not wealthy enough. Um, and they go fight in the revolution. It's about those two households and Cuba during the revolutionary uprising. So very, very, very interesting stuff. I really love your content. Would you be interested in talking to Kyle Kalinske in the future? Absolutely. I have a whole playlist called teaching Marxism to Kyle Kalinske, which I haven't updated in a while, but you know, I really should, I really should do another video. Um, because Kyle just so happens to be like the first leftist creator I ever watched. Like he's honestly responsible for sort of pipelining me into Marxism. Um, 
I watched Kyle's show forever. Uh, the only reason I stopped watching him was because like my girl, like even when I was a Marxist and reading Marx, I would still watch him. And then my girlfriend at the time didn't like Kyle. She thought he was like mean and abrasive um, and arrogant. So, <laughs> so she got tired of me always listening to him and I stopped listening to him. Um, looking back, she, she was pretty manipulative and made me do a lot of really weird stuff like that. But <laughs> like, I should have just listened to the show that I like to listen to and just listen to it when she's not there. But either way, um, this is actually about the failure of enlightenment ideals, which was one of the things that we discussed today in the imperialism reading guide talk, you know, cause Kyle will always say, we don't have freedom of speech. We don't have a real democracy. We don't have all these things that are in the constitution. It's like, yes, Kyle, because liberalism can't live up to its own ideals because the ideals of the enlightenment don't take capitalism and the economic mode of production into account. And capitalism leads to accumulation, concentration, and the formation of a financial oligarchy. And therefore, the masses can't have democracy under capitalism because capital monopolizes and controls the political system. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole playlist of... So that's what I'm going to do here. Kyle Kalinske videos. This was at my old apartment. Rest in peace. Um, yeah, I don't know. How do you search for a playlist? The whole playlist here. One about nationalizing big pharma. One where Biden calls... I mean, Kyle calls Joe Biden based. I had a lot of episodes of this show. I definitely should do another one. Definitely. Eddie the Kid, absolutely. Trying to explain any of this stuff to Kyle is like talking to a brick wall. He doesn't want to know it because it interferes with the lib grift. Yeah, that's what I. That's honestly why I stopped doing the series. Um, and I would love to sit down and talk to Kyle. And you know, I should pick that series up again. It'd still be useful, but it became less interesting for me as I became more educated about Marxism and you know the online media sphere. I was like, oh, he's just tied to his audience because that's his source of income. <laughs> Like Kyle said the same 10 or he said the same thing over and over again for the last 10 to 12 years because he knows that it's going to make him a certain amount of money, bring in a certain amount of Patreon supporters and he can survive, which I don't begrudge him that too much. But um, that's why he won't change his opinions or move left because he might lose audience members um, and lose income, which is something I, I didn't even realize how much of an effect that has, how much of an influence that is on people until I started doing this stuff myself, right? Until I started making some kind of uh, money from this stuff myself. And then it's like, oh, I can totally see how people would be influenced by profit motivation. People would be influenced by just trying to get the biggest audience possible and, you know, getting as many clicks as possible. Speaking of which, because I should probably head out here, Patreon.com slash Midwestern Marks is where you can support us, or you become a YouTube member, or you can become a Twitch subscriber, or you can send super chats and super stickers. But if you self-censorship RV George Habash says, yep, that's what it is. If you go to Midwestern Marks and you become a $10 Patreon supporter, well, you get this if you're a YouTube member as well, but um, you get a copy of the Journal of American Socialist Studies, an ebook copy. Um, and you're going to get an ebook of Carlos's new book next week. Um, so, yeah, shout out to all our existing Patreon supporters, our existing YouTube members, our existing Twitch subscribers, everyone who sent super chats and super stickers. Appreciate you all. Um, imagine if all our material needs were covered. We would have socialism already because people wouldn't be so busy working. But I mean, our material needs aren't met under capitalism, which is why we need capitalism. It's kind of a paradox. Either way, 
I got to head out to my uncle's Hall of Fame induction, y'all. So thank you for hanging out with me before that. I hope you enjoyed Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. I will get that edited into a video as soon as I possibly can. Put it up on the YouTube for you all. Till then, solidarity. Um, I might even do a stream tonight. I don't know what I got going on. Um, I'm sure people will want me to go out to the bars or be social or whatever, but I might just say, how about I don't and go stream and then I'll do that. So we'll see. Either way, I'll see y'all tomorrow or Monday or whenever else. Thanks for hanging out. Solidarity forever.